Decarbonization has been at the heart, um, was and, ha and is still is at the heart of the European policy agenda for many years now. Uh, however, in the past, it was much more along the lines of we need to find ways to support renewables to enter the markets. So to some extent, there was a financial burden element to them uh, in the previous uh, decades. The energy crisis shifted the focus on the other two aspects of the energy trilemma. We started focusing much more on affordability uh, and also security of supply. Uh, that is understandable. Uh, we, member states took action and took some very immediate action, the form of price caps predominantly. But paradoxically, uh, the long-term solution now appears to be, guess what, renewables. So they are now, renewables now appear to be the means to get to more affordable and more predictable electricity prices but also to limit our reliance on gas. So the, the EMD reform, the electricity market design reform, is effectively the long-term response, so what came after the very initial regulatory um, uh, interventions. There are three objectives. Uh, the one is protecting consumers, so protect consumers from what happened uh, a couple of years back, stability, for, uh, for everyone, for our industries, but also for, for consumers and competitive costs and prices for the European industry. The third one is to increase green electricity. And I could argue, and I personally don't see it as an objective in its own right, I see it as an enabler, an objective, but also an enabler for the other two. Because as I said earlier, now renewables are becoming a solution, uh, not just for us to reduce our carbon emissions, but also to have more predictable prices and uh, cheaper electricity. If I was to ask, if I was asked to summarize um, the, the EMD reform, I would say retain spot markets, retain the philosophy of um, marginal pricing, and hedge, hedge, hedge. So it's all about hedging. The majority of the measures and the guidance that is provided within that is about offering different forms of hedging that should spill over to the consumers as well and the demand. Um, so number one would be two-way CFTs contracts or equivalent. So for me, the or equivalent, I put a lot of emphasis on that. Uh, so we, we are intending to continue using these type of support instruments to bring in more res, uh, low carbon generation technologies. Uh, greater PPA uptake, uh, so complementing, let's say, the support schemes to also get market-based renewables, so more uh, on, on a more bilateral basis. But we should try to create the environment that, that attracts uh, this. Capacity markets are now recognized as a much more structural element. Uh, it was not that long ago where capacity markets were considered a bit of more of a temporary measure, uh, but now it is being recognized. Capacity markets are recognized as a structural element of the overall design. And from then on, it would be promoting further uh, forward uh, hedging for suppliers so that they are in a position to offer longer term contracts to consumers and, uh, and fixed prices to consumers. Now, I would say that the EMD reform is, is a, a good starting point uh, for, for a net zero market design, but there's a lot of things that we need to uh, consider and we need further evolution to address the challenges of decarbonization. I'm going to borrow something from a, a speech this morning from Dimitri Papalexopoulos that said, we need to act, so we need to implement that something as well. So yes, we do need to do our due diligence, but we need to also act very quickly and implement some of these changes very, very quickly. Because the challenges of decarbonization can be seen even today. Uh, so I'm going to mention a few, but there are a lot of others. Number one, We've seen this and it's very relevant over the last couple of months, zero and negative prices. We have a record number already. Uh, we're going for a record number of zero and negative prices uh, this year. 
this is challenging the economics of res and to some extent renewables the energy transition is kind of undermining itself um, so we need to figure out ways of solving this uh, there is a need for not just backup capacity but also flexibility and also stability however despite the fact that this is recognized everyone knows that it exists the business case is not so clear-cut right and we we do have a lack of instruments that allow hedging and bringing technologies um, and not just technologies other solutions because it doesn't have to be necessarily um, an asset per se um, and grid, grid congestion is on the rise uh, and redispatch costs are very very high and they will continue increasing so what should a net zero market design uh, look like so I'm not gonna offer a single solution I'm gonna offer some thoughts effectively and some principles that I think are very important first and foremost closer to real-time markets or spot markets should be at the core they're very important I, I've heard a lot of people and a lot of people have asked me how does a spot market work if everything that is on the system is effectively zero variable cost and I say if anything they become even more important because the the resources that do need the spot markets, they're closer to real-time markets, are the weather variable renewables, their availability is known much closer to real-time, and the demand, their availability is known much closer to real-time. So I would say we should double down to some extent closer to real-time markets. The other one is we, we should start thinking beyond the simple megawatt-hour terms. Um, and what do I mean by that? Typically, we discuss about the price of electricity. Uh, which is effectively the price of wholesale energy uh, for providing a given settlement period. When I see someone quoting a zero price period, I also want to know at that same time, what is the value of reserve? What is the value of inertia? What is the value of all these other ancillary services that make up the reliable supply of electricity to our houses? Okay? Um, so for me, it is a matter of having a much broader picture of what we mean by a cost of electricity and that should include also redispatch costs as well now when it comes to capacity markets i think capacity markets need to evolve so we need to start thinking about capability slash flexibility rather than capacity simple capacity i need one megawatt to make peak demand and that starts off by thinking beyond the simple loss of load expectation measure that tells you, okay, in a given, I have, uh, I have a probability of losing the load for three hours in a given year. I want to know when are the subsequent hours, and I want to know how much as well. Now, one other aspect is because we are at the same time trying to promote both government-supported um, long-term contracts, but also PPAs, and we want to have forward liquidity, there's a bit of tension. So by the, the two-way safeties effectively detract some of the liquidity from the other markets. So we need to find ways of managing this and how we can make this work. And uh, I'm going to keep this for later, so we'll discuss a little bit about uh, uh, in the panel discussion, one, one, one idea on that. And finally, grid and locational signals. I know um, this is a very big thing, especially in Britain at the moment, the locational signals. Um, this doesn't mean we, we need to have no door pricing, right? We are so far away in Europe from that. It doesn't mean that. But we should have a way of recognizing the cost of transporting the electricity across our network. Um, at the end of the day, however, we need to find smart solutions to manage our, our grid as it is today. But we will need to build grids, right? Let's not kid ourselves. Not everything can be, uh, can be managed by smart solutions. We will have to have some more cables. Um, so we, we, we have been working quite a lot on the um, uh, RIMA, which is the, the equivalent, let's say, of the market reform in Britain. To some extent, Britain is, is, a, is one step ahead because the problems are more uh, acute uh, there. So they've been thinking about various things and they've been looking at a much more holistic basis, like overhauling everything. They have made a lot of decisions already, um, some, some way to go. Um, my, my brief summary, and these, these things, you know, can be borrowed and, uh, you know, they can be a lesson also for, for other uh, European member states. I think we concluded that a revolutionary approach would be a mistake. So we are not at a stage that we should rip up everything we've got and, 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 and effectively 
change everything radically, so it should be evolution rather than revolution. There is a need for centralized support and planning where we are today, given the scale of renewables we need to deploy, but we should be mindful that at some point this needs to tail off and we need to allow for um, innovation and the market to choose um, the, the, the technology mix. Um, and uh, yeah, various other things that I've mentioned al already to, to some extent. So I'm going to close off with uh, one thought. Um, we think about all the various technologies, assets on the, on the system, storage, gas turbines, renewables, etc. I would say that the consumers uh, and the people are effectively the most important part of the system, the most important element and resource on the system. At the end of the day, they can turn their lights on and they have the choice to turn the lights off. So uh, we should do the design that we have, the market design that we have should be centered around the consumers and allowing them to have the choice and be enabled to, to, to effectively choose when and how and how much electricity they want to consume. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.